Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co-hosts. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because the more the merrier. Do you love our content and want to see us expand? Support us on Patreon. We're just getting our start with producing video content as well, and we can put more time and supplies into this endeavor with your support. Additionally, we are putting out a bonus episode every week where we review tournament stats. It is available on our Patreon to subscribers only. Hope to see you there. In today's episode, we interview a a good friend of mine, Lee, Um, local to the same scene as me and we chat about organizing narrative events as well as inquisition we've got a lot to talk about considering that narrative is one of the i don't know if it's the most popular way to play because it there's no way for us to ever know really yeah it's hard i feel like to like really get into narrative with because it's like someone has to run it and like that can sometimes feel like a chore especially if you're doing like a long-term narrative game which I haven't done. I know Will did it, and it's just like trying to do yeah. what you're doing, and then people constantly coming back. Yeah, it's a whole. It's a lot. <laughs> I definitely tried. We've definitely tried running a narrative campaign in New York, and we've done all the way from this like grand scale Wednesday, like Wednesday night, all the generals met up and they would pick where their soldiers were gonna go, and then each of those soldiers fought either a kill team game or 40k game, and that was insane. And I did it for like six months i think and i slowly went crazy because there was like meta rules and like lining things up and lining up the number of factions and i went crazy and then the next 40k campaign was like much easier to keep track of and then we did something similar again for kill team and that also drove me insane and drove the guy who wrote the story kind of crazy so now the current campaign in new york is just tracking the monthly score with an apocalypse game every three months because the apocalypse is like the reward for toughing it out yeah, I've never done an apocalypse game, and I was like, God, it looks like so much fun. <laughs> I think it's funny because it's like it is cool, but it's cool and also terrible because you are trapped for like ten hours, and it looks yeah. great yeah. because there's a lot of stuff, but it just takes forever for anything to there resolve. Was that like, so I mean, like with the apocalypse stuff that you did, did you do like that apocalypse system that had like D12s and like armor saves in a different phase and all that, or was it just like a three thousand plus point game? No, they are. 12.5k point games i think the last player or the whole thing no for the whole thing so like generally players are i think the largest one we've had was a 30,000 point game with three factions at 10,000 points each and like we're basically just playing ninth or tenth with fast rolling and also everything dies at the end of a phase so like if you get shot you still get to shoot back before you go away and it it is really crazy and it is kind of fun but you know like lining up and seeing six bane blades that's a spectacle that doesn't really go away oh <laughs> yeah i can only imagine yeah i, I like can up, a... i can pull up a couple photos and drop them in our group chat so that just we can spitball but like i think one of the other cool things that we've done is that we've mixed the kill team and the 40k narrative so i think the last one we ran there was a small central fortress that the kill teams were infiltrating into and then they left kind of like saving private ryan so they in during the course of the 40k game so this is how long the 40k apocalypse game takes they started playing round one every phase the kill team players were allowed to move six inches they made it in in the course of turn one they made it out in the course of i think the beginning of turn three for the 40k game and that oh. was like a eight player kill team game inside of a fortress with like a group of assassins defending this mushroom so it was it was pretty crazy yeah that sounds like a fun story i could definitely get like some players who like to play 40k more into the kill team scene and see maybe people who want to play that are playing kill team want to play some 40k definitely yeah get it's behind kind of like a, like a fun way to like show off both sides but it gets really really chaotic and the pictures are always kind of cool but they also are just like a crazy amount of visual noise because you cannot tell what is happening yeah yeah I, mean, I feel like the, always the rules layering can sometimes be funky like from 40k to kill team if you're trying to match them a little bit <laughs> yeah so for example it's just like stuff oh man everywhere 
But yeah. I think in one of our campaigns, we had a guy. So the overarching, I, I don't you guys haven't had a chance to do like these crazy overarching stories, but at least in Brooklyn or Brooklyn, one of the overarching stories is like we started with a space Hulk. It crashed into a planet. It split the planet into like it split the crust of the planet, awakened some Necron technology. And that's what that was the the grand strategy game that we did for mm-hmm. a while. And yeah, it's just, it gets real crazy. And Apocalypse is, is always a hoot, but it's definitely it definitely makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's a it's a system that's made that to really make a lot of sense. It's just there for fun. They'll, they are like somebody's gonna want to do this, so we might as well lay the ground rules. Yeah, I mean, luckily in Kill Team, the game is much closer to kind of like a narrative experience, kind of out of the box, right? Yeah, well, it definitely feels like that to me. I mean, it's just like when you're playing 40k, like narrative, it's just like you're you feel like a general, you know, kind of navigating a whole army, and so like you kind of feel like you kind of miss the the fun stuff that's like happens in stories. You just you're basically you're telling the story of a battle. I feel like you're playing Kill Team. Like you could really just be playing a storyline of a single operative fighting for his life, you know, or with his team and trying to survive. And and, and that's yeah. the part I love the most. And how do you try to help set those moments up as like a narrative game master? You know, I've gone all the way from trying unique, like a unique background that kind of added extra rules to the game. We've done like the full narrative rules for a couple months, which meant that Space Marines, I think in general, just kind of way overperform because each space marine gets three to five experience every game and they just quickly overrun everyone else because your captain space marine now has a two-up save hits on twos ceaseless and all these other crazy things and you're like oh i've I've killed one guy sergeant i know i was we did a narrative uh with will one time and i had a my reaver had a reaver sergeant that could charge from conceal and had a suppressed pistol and it was just like oh so he's just on conceal all the time and just literally kill anybody (laughs) was that the uh the narrative league that was going on for a while yeah that was the narrative league that he was he tried to do for a while it was super fun but yeah that's one of the things that's like trying to keep track of all this stuff especially if you don't know narrative very well like trying to forego it by yourself is like can be very daunting and just like not it can really scare a lot of people away i was kind of like focus on just like the story of like hey this is like the story that's going on i like to have just random events instead of like you know the equipment and stuff like uh, we did the into the dark uh for a renegade and i and then we were just going into the that was all phasing out and we were kind of going into beta decima i think this is even before beta decima was even revealed maybe yeah it was and yeah and so we were kind of like i was like well clearly we're phasing out of this it's going to go into you know maybe jungle everyone was speculating i was like let's like have the ship crashing like what or let's like this like you know the into the dark that whole area is just it's falling apart people are going crazy everyone's trying to escape clearly that's kind of the story i feel like they were leaning towards with the four into the dark sets anyways so i was like oh let's just like i play a lot of magic and so i was like d20s are like you're always rolling d20s it seems like it's like you have that's how you kind of determine how things happen a lot. And I was like, why don't you just like at the end of a turn, you just roll a D20 and random stuff happens. And I actually spitballed that idea to Jason once. And Jason was like, oh, I really like that. It- you should build something off of that. So I like one time was we just... We tested it started. for like a couple months and everything. Yeah, yeah. And then I uh, I just started one night, I just started writing and I just kept going and kept going because it was just coming to me and coming to me. I, I think I wrote, did the whole base uh, which was pretty much like two pages of rules and stuff. And like I came up with it in just a night and then I brought it to Jason and we play tested it a bunch and had some other people come in and play test it. And, and I kind of took what they thought and sometimes they're like, yeah, this is like really oppressive. Can we like not do that? And like, let's try to like hurt. Like we, one of them was like oh everyone just has like a minus one apl if like if this happens and then it's like okay start of the turn like you're in into the dark and you're playing a vet guard team or something or a guard team and you just all your guys are minus one apl yeah. right off the bat it's so just like, like oh gosh so like, you instead just can't of do like anything a full narrative thing like spec ops with like level ups and stuff like that it was like um the ga- it's like the mission itself was the narrative stuff um and i, I posted a couple of pictures in our in our group chat as well um, with the crazy yeah, light, the, the bright red, like kind of setting the mood. I think this is something that the GW events do. So at the World Championships, they have like the desert room where all the lights mm-hmm. are bright. They have sand on the tables. They have the ice room where the AC is turned down. So in the picture that Lee and Jason are talking about, there is a room that's all lit in red. So as you are in the dark, Space Hulk is going down. The lights are blaring. And that's I think that's a nice visual image yeah. to help get people in the mood. <laughs> Yeah, you know, my like, example yeah. of something like this was when we dropped our players into the warp in the first New York Open. I had like a space mat that all of our boards were on and they went to lunch. I removed all the boards and then just tossed a mishmash of terrain into the warp and they were forced to make a lot of jump tests. Love that. That sounds like fun. 
So, but yeah, so like the, just like, I, I think taking people's interest and just trying to make something that's like going to be pretty balanced and pretty fun. And then like, they're just finding stuff that helps them. Um, I think like throughout the, that endeavor, I think it just makes it something that's simple. Cause like, you don't want to go too complicated either. Like I found out that like trying to do too many things at once or trying to try to remember all of these effects. It was just, it ends, it ends up being missed a lot. And the, then it, I feel like it loses a lot of its sparkle of people like, Oh, I missed that. Or I missed this, you know? Yeah. Fully- so Keep things simple, just or it's like because you pretty much roll the die, something happens. There's a couple of things where it's like, oh, you're in the dark, so you have like a you know, a lot harder to see, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah, so like the so some of the examples, so like in like um the into the dark narrative, for example, um, we had the initiative role to, to decide who gets the initiative for the turn was on a d20, and that was linked to a random effect. So, like, if I roll like an 18 and you roll a two, I've got the initiative, but then the two was like distant explosion nothing happens and the 18 was like um airlock bursts or or something like that and it was just like all no, the doors in a random room it would just blow up <laughs> yeah so like there's all sorts of crazy stuff that could happen um so there was like a gravity slam that would send everyone into one of the walls there was like all the doors in a certain room close and everyone inside acts like they're injured for the turn um and then there was like the lights go out and everything past like four inches is not visible all sorts of crazy stuff like that so like the, the these narrative events was just like fun rules and it didn't add a whole lot of crunchy bits it was like like Lee was saying earlier, like keep it simple. And it was just like a half a page of extra text that adds fluff and kind of like adds to the, the narrative element. And like the events that you've been doing have been pretty successful. Um, and Will's been doing narrative events as well. Um, and that was kind of like Travis was talking earlier with... Um, there was like team captains. So there's like a chaos team and like an Imperium team and like Xenos would kind of be thrown in there, however. And then like the team captain would like assign people to different maps. So you could kind of like wager for your matchups and things like that. So there was like 10 players in six maps. So there was like a leftover one. Um, so mm-hmm. we've done all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and how's it? So like, I know that you and Will are working on another narrative event coming up in Minnesota in May. Do you have enough yeah, sketch yeah. out that you're, you've got something to talk about there or? Yeah, not we, quite yet? we went hard this last Saturday. Um, I was, I was a little under the weather, but, um, we was just kind of coming out of it just, but uh, we, I mean, I can pull it up here, but like I said, I go over it. So the, the general idea is that we're basically, we're there's two different teams of inquisitors and they're like, and there's this rising tyrannic problem that they desperately needs to be dealt with. And one team's like, we need to just eradicate these guys. There's, we need to really just team up, hose, uh, hammer down and just kill them. And the other team's like, wait, these guys could potentially be, you know, a great asset to us. Let's try to like control them, you know, which is like obviously not, it, it's not, um, you know, doesn't make the emperor smile by any means, you know. So some people so call have, it heresy. <laughs> exactly. That sounds like a paddling <laughs> if I've ever heard a 40k meme. So and so they're going kind of back and forth, you know, doing this. And so we have all we have like, and we also wanted to do something where I wanted to incorporate some stuff from like Dark Tide with like stems and stuff. I thought that would be kind of fun where you, you're. You have you guys can take stims into battle and you can basically choose a single operative and they can basically get a small buff for the turning point. Anything from like getting additional attacks to like increasing their ballistic or weapon skills or like healing up like into their movement or like some more like even maybe giving them an extra APL. Uh, obviously, we got to play test this and see what's going to be good or what's going to be too overpowered. I thought it'd be fun to even like make them so they stack so you could really like take his bunch. Like you only take a limited number of drugs, but you take them all and you could literally just dump them onto one guy and just make him a powerhouse for a turn or something something okay here's an idea if you give so you can give someone multiple drugs but then there's like a hazard to it no oh, i thought about that too i thought that would be very very fun it's very like witcher potion vibes mm-hmm. for, for anyone who's listening who has like fun ideas or things that they've done that have worked well make sure to drop them in our discord because i yeah, think we, i we love a fair, number of, so. <laughs> a fair number of narrative people who are focused on narrative stuff in our discord anyways you know the new york open has a narrative every year we've had on you know once upon a kill team i think yeah yep. and they've got some fun stuff we've also had ben battle brothers ben who has done a narrative campaign with a bunch of pox walkers so there's been a lot of different ideas if you've got some cool ideas that have been fun or you're looking for a little bit of help on you know moving your narrative campaign along our discord is a good spot yeah yeah i, I think it'd be fun if we even if you had an event i would think we even like exchange paperwork you know <laughs> here's, here's one for my narrative i'll take yours and run it here mm-hmm. yeah little narrative mission swap on the discord mm-hmm. yeah i will say yeah. that like the this year's near or the last year's new york open we definitely did not use that many of the narrative rules and we really just focus on hammering the narrative home and i think mm-hmm. that went over very well because we gave everybody 
everybody a little bit of like AI prompting to kind of help give you a, a setup for your team, which was nice. Mm-hmm. So it was like a robot that would help you basically kind of like spitball why your team is on the planet or what your motivations were. Mm-hmm. And that was really nice. And a nice yeah. way to kind of get everybody in the mood. Yeah. One of the things that I liked about like some of these one day tournaments, especially Will's, is that he still incorporates like rare equipment into his. And so sometimes you just get the, the wackiest stuff. Like I had a Armighty's leader that had a fusion pistol from the Eldar and he just went around just one shotting everybody. It was phenomenal. <laughs> sound pretty fun. Yeah, I had like in that same campaign, I had a uh, a Banshee warrior <laughs> with like a, a sniper rifle or something crazy like that. So I was like, oh, I've got my shooting threat. <laughs> Yeah, um, so that was all actually part of a mechanism where there was extra objective markers on the board. Um, they, I think it might have been like a light cover, like crate thing. And then you could run up to it and do a one AP action to loot it. And then you could flag down Will and he'd run over with a, like a deck of cards and you'd, you'd draw one. Or he'd give you a token and then you could spend that at the end of the, between rounds to pull cards from the deck. And that could be like something like, um, some of those would be like the grand prize where you get the store credit for the event. And some of them were like, you get rare equipment. And some of them were like, um, um, you get extra like tokens for the the mini game like wager on your battles thing. Um, it sounds more complicated than it was. It was pretty straightforward. Um, but yeah, so like the narrative stuff, we've had a lot of homebrew stuff in our narrative. Yeah, narrative mm-hmm. is the home of the homebrews. Do you feel like there was anything that you remember being very standout that players talked about a lot afterwards? Uh, I think especially at Will's, they really like. Um, just the teamwork. So it's like you, if you were two teams, you know, focus, focusing on each other. So like it, there was a lot less feel bad. Like if you like lost all three of your rounds because like you felt so felt like you were so comp like contributing to the team. Mm-hmm. Um, which I, I know a lot of people like um, with the Into the Dark one. I think people literally liked the whole like all the lights, obviously, and really set the mood and the theme. But it's just like having something that's balanced, that's like can kind of just catch you off guard. Like this kind of the surprise events like of a, was fun. It's like sometimes like you'd be setting up and then all of a sudden you're like going in there and you'd like get thrown a completely different side of the ship. And then there's even times where someone was like literally like, oh, hey, we need to like rush in and get this point. And the next turning point, that point blew up and killed like, you know, four operators and you're like oh well that didn't go as planned you know just yeah and like for that event i even put together a playlist and like you know i started off with the with the doom soundtrack and then i like chopped up the stuff that was like a little too calm or like arranged it in a way and then i like specifically made like a four-hour playlist that ramped up intensity over the duration of four hours um and then like by the end it was like time's up and then it went back to like calm kind of like but still like doom vibe music but like a little more calm um and i like the the guy that was running the whole convention jamie um he told me later he's like every now and then i see an event at the convention that i'm like damn i wish i was like playing in that and not running it and that was one of them with like the soundtrack and the lights and like he loves kill team and Mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's gotta feel good when it when you get like the the feedback like that Mm -hmm. and i think yeah narrative i think that is the the same vibe that i got from a lot of people at this year's new york open is like oh that looked really fun because we had like these big big forest trees and then a trench board and we had a subway which you know they all had like slightly different things going on and just like visually it looked nice which which does help and i think this Mm -hmm. year we're gonna have potentially a war or like a a dead titan as one of our narrative boards oh that would be cool yeah, that sounds pretty epic. That reminds yeah. me, I don't know if you guys have seen it. There was a guy who did the, I can't remember, there was a giant tow ship and he had a kill team and I, he had glass half dead on it. Yeah, yeah, that was on play on. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> yeah, I wish the gameplay was a little bit cleaner on that episode. I think there yeah, was there was definitely a couple of mistakes. Oh, like, oh, I don't know if this is how the game is supposed to be played, but it was a very cool game because it was on top of a Manta, definitely GW's literal most expensive model. Yeah, can't, you don't get to do that every day. Yeah, so like, do you do you, are you building some of your own set pieces, Lee, or is there someone in your community that helps you build up the narrative uh, displays, basically? Um, in this displays, you're kind of like talking the events or just like the like terrain sort of stuff yeah kind of like terrain because like in my area we have uh grot guard he has like an all grot army but is he like enjoys building boards so he has a trench board that he brought over from mm-hmm. from wherever he moved from and then he also helped us build the force boards and now he's helping us build the titan boards so yeah we've got a guy who's like really into terrain yeah and we have a really good painter in our area so do you have anyone like that that helps to support kind of the narrative effort um right now i we don't 
really have anybody that does a lot of terrain. Um, we do have just, I mean, I just bought myself a 3D printer here recently. I know another guy did. And so we've been kind of talking, I mean, and there's a couple of us that, are, that already had it before that, that talking about getting these, are using the 3D printers to 3D print terrain that we could use for narrative events or other events. And especially with this one coming up, Will is very good and very, is utilizing the resources that he has available to him to find these STLs of really cool terrain. Like what he's got, I guess he has one for like a Tyranid infested, like into the dark stuff that he's going to, we're really looking at into printing some of that and um, labs. And he has like a Tyranid infested, like, like Eldar ruins. Like, so we're going to use stuff like that like i said if, if that's he's the first person that comes to mind when when uh, talking about that no i think that's that's exactly kind of what i'm thinking about like anyone you know for any listeners who are mm-hmm. interested in doing stuff like this talk to your community members especially if you kind of help to and you're interested like finding the people who are interested in 3d printing you know because i feel like most of the pretty established warhammer communities probably have at least one person in the area that's really into 3d printing so like connecting with that person and trying to find out what you can figure out together is definitely a big part of it like if yeah. you go over the eons of battle they always have new terrain you know being a patreon mm-hmm. for one month for some cool terrain if you've got a friend with the printer definitely can give you a narrative board that most of your players would never see otherwise right yeah yeah and honestly like if anybody's on the fence about getting a 3d printer like 100 recommend it like I, I, I think i spent like two or three hundred dollars on mine and like i said and i've pretty much been running non and it's been really very very easy i had zero ex- experience coming into it and it you get it's it's very easy you're using a fdm printer yep yep yeah i do get the sense that the space has gotten much easier to get into because i know when i started mm-hmm. it in 2016 17 it was a little bit less accessible and like the printers required a lot more fiddling i think a lot of the newer printers definitely come out of the box way more ready to go and like resin printing is much much better than it was you know even like three or four years ago yeah yeah i haven't quite stepped my foot into that jason's been pushing me but a little i don't have the space for that unfortunately at the moment yeah because you want to like vent that out and stuff yeah it's a lot of extra stuff that you got to carry around Mm mm-hmm all right, going to jump in real quick with a quick shout out to our sponsor, Wargames Atlantic. Wargames Atlantic makes sick miniatures for great prices. Each kit includes enough parts for 24 models with loads of special weapons. It's great for your Astro Militarum factions, Trader Guard factions, Kasserkin, stuff like that. Um, and it's also awesome for any other miniatures agnostics games that you might play such as The End, message me on Discord if you want to learn more about The End. Check the show notes for a link. Anything that you buy through that link will support the podcast as well. All right, back to the podcast. So what kind of teams have you been really into, Lee? You know, we've been talking about narrative. Are you mostly playing narrative or are you also dabbling your feet in the competitive side? I've been doing a lot more into the competitive side lately i've been i actually really want to try and do some of these bigger events um jason had that kill team uh adepticon practice and blaine and some six-sided legion showed up and i was really hoping to get a game against him but uh fortunately i did not (laughs) but yeah lately i've been playing a lot of inquisition lately um i was playing arbides before them but they kind of been feeling bad and so i i picked up inquisition because i was like i already have this team i can just i can still use them with this team and uh yeah i've been having a lot of success locally with uh inquisition i'm still not playing them to their fullest but um it's kind of crazy to think to to look back at the games and be like wow i probably pretty easily could have won that if i would have just remembered this or did this oh and sometimes you just dice you like there was a game i was playing with um a guy here and he was playing um harlequins and he literally denied me like five victory points just because i couldn't kill two guys and then he like not he couldn't even just stop me from doing if i would have just killed i would have gotten five victory points and just won (laughs) but but i just rolled bad and sometimes that's just that's just how the game goes i think inquisition specifically is also one of those teams because you are the team looks very good on paper it's got lots of operative choices it's got strong operatives too but Mm. the majority of your fighters and your shooters are going to be hitting on fours which means that even with all the rerolls in the world there's going to be a handful of times where your quest keeper just you know rolls a bunch of twos twice yeah or your you know your veteran guard your breacher goes up with a melta or a plasma and you just roll the one hit and then you reroll one dice and your opponent saves one you're like all right cool i've lost what i needed i lost what would have been a guaranteed kill on a quarry that could have shifted over to something else and pressured something else and now you're trapped yeah yeah, nothing feels worse than that when you're you're going for that quarry operative and you're like oh this is going to be an easy kill and then you just can't kill them and then they're then your one piece that you were using they have a lot of i'd say they have a lot of good threat but then once you like their threats are all pretty squishy so it's like you kill them and then you're like that's losing key pieces very well 
Yeah, there's not a ton of redundancy on the team. You know, last week we had Jay the Sloth on and he talked about how he uses Kasserkin and Breachers. Are you using similar secondary operatives? Yeah, I've actually been using um, Novice Breachers pretty much all the time now. I did start with the team with Kasserkin um, and I've used Arbides once. But um, yeah, the Kasserkin are really good. I wasn't too happy with their shooting. Um, Having only five operatives and you're taking a comms and, you know, a medic. And then you're like you said, I've been taking the plasma gun because the plasma cannon is really slow and a lot of teams are just can out navigate it they just walk around it and avoid it which i mean is good on its own sense but people do the same when you have the heavy bolter and uh and having a, a plasma having the heavy bolter and that it just gives you another threat yeah like the plasma gun with the comms you can have a move dash and take a shot so you can really get angles on people especially now mm-hmm. with like the recon trooper can off spec someone get rid of obscuring plus like all the mobility of the three apl on the plasma gun have you been like leaning into that stuff at all Oh yeah, the the, the, the using the like the Casterkin guy and giving the plus one to the the plasma gun and the and your pistol ear like that that's been very very good. I, I've never like I said the I'm almost statically give the the pistol ear the plus one APL just because he he almost deletes anything he runs up to, especially if you give him you know the heirloom pistol or the the upgraded pistol. Then he's like, oh, I got a bolter pistol with a suppressed bolter pistol and a plasma pistol. You know, does that plasma it, pistol hit on threes in close range? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's a good yeah, he's, one. He's by far your most reliable shooter in all the senses of the word. Very similar to the Void the Void Master on the Lucidian Star Shredders. When you can shoot twice for one AP and both of your guns are threatening, it matters a lot. And the Void Masters are getting around with four attacks on twos, four four, and four attacks mm-hmm. on threes, three four balanced. And your Inquisition guy gets a whole plasma gun and a bolter with silence. So he I'm sure he does a lot of work. Yeah, he can. And you can give him like the, the armor that gives him an invul- four up invulnerable save. Um, he, oh. yeah, he's, he's a threat. Is, are we, are yeah. we hearing about a Doom guy? <laughs> yeah, pretty here. much. You could. I was thinking about it. You could. You can put a lot of points on him and make him very, very hard to kill. You could. You can give him a plasma knife, too. He, he's yeah. just sounds like, all sounds the like it sounds like we're in range for niche tactics right now. Um. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So ni- niche tactics for Inquisition. Niche tactics. Throw some combos at us. Like, what are some of the cool like secret weapons, like secret combos? Some of your favorite plays. Like, you know, positioning for things. Like, what what do you got for uh, mm-hmm. niche tactics for Inquisition? Yeah. Oh, I love the the novice breachers. I feel like have the most combos that you can set up. And they also tend to be very flexible. Um, I, I, even with Jason, we were playing on the last game for that Adepticon practice game. I yeah. set up a got a, a bunker that was just absolutely nuts. Uh, it was like I don't know if I think I got over there turn like turn three, and I had my endurance in front of the door, but he was like he was two circle away from a point, which is important for their defensive reroll. And then I had my leader behind him with his defensive aura. So if you shot at anybody within circle of my leader, you got minus one die. And then I had my plasma pistol leader behind him. So my leader was being protected by it. So you couldn't shoot the leader. And then my plasma pistol was just kind of peeking over their shoulder and just shooting over too. Yeah, and so over the shield guy. I was having a hell of a time. So if you were to try to shoot my pistol leader, you would, Jason was going to get, would get minus two dice and I'd get a defensive reroll. Yep. So then oh, it was the like shoot straight for the shield guy, but then it's like he's got a two up with a reroll as well, um, and then it's like, um, and oh, he's even minus, minus one, one die. Regardless. Yeah. So I was like, I had like my incursor sergeant and the incursor marksman both shoot at your shield like two turns in a row, and then he like finally died. But it was just like was not enough because it's like if you got two space marines shooting at one guy, double tapping for two turns in a row, and like that, that's what it takes to kill him. It's like you're in a bad spot. That was a, that was yep. a pretty and gnarly castle. We just ran in there, just killed a guy right after that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. That's that's more like a really fun combo that to set up. It takes a little while, but if you can, especially on Into the Dark, if you can set it up, it just you can create literally an impossible point to get yeah, through. So that, that, was, just... that was like the three operatives. It was the plasma pistol behind the shield with the leader with the minus one attack dice aura. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like that that can get you a lot of a lot of uh, noodling around there. Um, did you did you come across any other like really exciting combos that you were particularly excited about? Yeah, the 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 cat the use of, like being it's not really necessarily a combo; it's just more of a setup. I guess it's kind of a combo then. But yeah, you just like having your cat kind of dash up into protection right off the bat, 
and then you move him and then you just kind of have him set up and then you just basically out activate your opponents because inquisition has the highest activation and then you usually just like your last activator is usually if you're running as like a horde team your plasma cannon and so then you like hopefully like you said there's either an area that your opponents are going to be afraid to set up within six inches of that cat or like when that happens every i think almost every game i've had i just i dash the cat up people always ask what the cat does i tell them and they're like okay and then i place my token right by the guy's feet the plasma cannon comes out and then he ends up killing like three guys turn one the plasma cannon and the cat yep yep so yeah the cat just kind of sets up and the surveyor actually places the the token and it's it's really really good like the, the, just because the cat can either give you an area denial to your opponent where it's like, okay, if you move here, like you're going to get shot. Like and it, then you have enough heavy gun or like you have your, you have your pistol here if you want, or like your plasma gun kind of behind some heavy and like, hopefully behind like not visible. And like I said, you just, or like I said, you can have your endurance again with the pistol with uh, your plasma cannon or your melt gun or your heavy bolter with being protected by your endurance. So they can't shoot it. Even if he has an engage order. And then you just kind of set that up and it's like, okay, if you do anything, like you're going to get shot and you're going to lose an operative or sometimes you just do it. And yeah, it's, it it gets, even if you kill one guy, it catches a lot of people off guard and it it literally can collapse the whole side very, very quickly if we're trying to recover. I think that is definitely the reason why most people are taking the Imperial Mm -hmm. Navy Reapers when it comes to support. Just because the endurance is such an insane model to give to give anyone, really. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's not. I don't know. Like I said, the whole Inquisition team feels like just setting up. I, I don't know if there's like a really a whole lot of like uh, combos that I can think of off the top of my head, other than like the pretty basic like Mystic buff onto like the heavy bolter that can. So and then it just you just guarantee P one, um, which is always very nice. Is there any other pieces that combo especially well with the Mystic? Uh, I mean, the the, uh, the Grenadier is always a really good one, too. Um, just, like, or anything with Blast, like the Plasma Can is good, too. But I, I found it most useful with, like, making... It makes a Frag Grenade very, a little more scary, too. Um, especially if you put it game. on someone like the the um, Penal Legionnaire. Because he gets full... He'll get full rerolls, even, um, if there's an a, a tar- injured target. Or not injured, but, like, any wounds minus the full health. Yeah, and you you stick him on a frag with a mystic buff, and he said if he hits anybody with full any wounds missing, like then it's just like it can just kill operatives, even like space marines sometimes. Um, otherwise it's like okay, you do a bunch of damage with a frag, and now you can just run in there and just clean up next turning point with with relentless because he's a flamer, a flamer pistol and a chainsword. Yeah, I was kind of thinking about um that uh, I forget which, which one it is, but the dude that has the the. Five seven lethal five single hit knife. Yeah, he the death world vet. He is very cool, but I honestly I have actually not taken him a lot just because um, almost every time I've taken him, he's kind of uh, not done a lot. <laughs> it's fair. It would be he would be kind of neat if you ran him alongside the the skull, right? Yeah, that's kind of oh, that'd be that's the second only way the I would skull? really yeah, imagine him playing him. Oh, yeah, 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 having two dice. Plus the mystic but, buff. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe that's too much. Um, yeah, the, the, I find his spear to be a little more useful, just because uh, a little more reliable. Because so I think his spear still does like five six damage, but S- still with very five, nice. Seven, like, on, like on a two up, and you upgrade it to a crit. Yeah, just, you can one hit kill something. Which I guess mm-hmm. isn't the yeah. most important thing. We yeah, found the it, necessarily Doom Guy team. So if anyone has been playing Inquisition and has <laughs> and wants to try it with us, I'm sure Jason is gonna get leaded to a couple <laughs> a couple of these attempts. Let's get cooking on the Yeah, I mean I'm definitely Doom down guy. for it, like I said. But yeah, it's it he's it's a little difficult. Like I said, he like his he has his ability is like he just basically just a scratch a normal, but Beat him being only a seven wound operative himself, it, it's like there's not a lot of matches in which he actually does good. There's just better melee options, unfortunately. Yeah, that's fair. Invalid. I mean, he's he's like the one of the best looking models on the team. Now that's like the hardest part. <laughs> he's such a cool looking dude. Yeah, uh, one of the other ones that jumped out to me for the the mystic is just like put him with the caster and sniper, and then like it's mm-hmm. like if you roll a single crit and you upgrade to another one, like you can auto kill like mostly everything in the game. Um, and then, like, if you don't roll a crit, if you get, like, you know, like, three three hits, you upgrade one to a crit, that'll still probably kill most most things. 
Yeah, yeah. But, um, another good kind of cool thing is if you have the the novice Laz or not the yeah the novice breachers um, Laz volley gun because it has six attacks. If you have the skull, you can actually bump it up to seven attacks. Which there's no gun in kill team with seven attacks. That would be the only way you can do it. <laughs> it's pretty gnarly. Yeah. So and it has like full relentless on top of it too, and P one I believe. Yeah. Uh, does it? Have, I, don't, I don't think it doesn't have P one, does it? No, it just has relentless. Oh, it has, has relentless, relentless and okay. fusillade. The so one can, has P one. <laughs> yeah, with seven dice with fusillade is like almost okay. Yeah, because then you can finally split it and actually kill two things. And you know, if you, I'm not sure if Quarry would transfer over mid shot. No, it does not. It's it's because it kind of all happened at the same but time. It's relentless on its own, right? Yeah, yeah, you oh, wouldn't need to worry. Perfect. It's never limitless. Getting too tricky with it. All right, so maybe the the niche that we're we're playing around with is some Doom Guy stuff on Inquisition, just because they have some of the biggest inventory. Do you have certain loadouts that you really like doing? I know you've already mentioned that you like to give your pistolier the bolter, but are you taking like the standard melee loadout for the interrogator, or do you have other things that you found that you've liked? on the inquisition squad because they do have one of the largest armories in the game yeah um i do like throwing the um upgraded pistol on the mystic as well because he has a very sleeper profile on him that i think gets overlooked he hits on twos and he also has a you know a normal pistol but with the upgrader it turns into a bolter pistol but his pistol also has indirect so he can kind of become a random threat out of nowhere or if you need him to clean something up yeah, and doesn't he's also a good one to do that. Yeah, he hits on twos. Yeah, yeah, hits on twos indirect. Turn it into a bolter pistol. That is very strong. And so, but yeah, I tend to. Um, I like to take a lot of the melee operatives from the novice breachers. Um, like I was when I was playing against um, the harlequins. Like I said, I did. I didn't take any gunners. I took all melee operatives, the cat and the surveyor. And because I was like, I, AP is worthless in this fight. I just want. And the like invulnerable saves doesn't matter if I'm hitting you in the face with an axe. And um, it was a very good game. But yeah, I, I think I, I, I had like so like half my team by the end of the game and he had two or he had, he had three operatives all with like three or less wounds left. So Did that he seems use good. a Cargurix death or were you able to get around it by using the the mystics, you know, free crit on re- free crit retain? What was that? Well, the big a big problem for most melee teams when they play against void dancers is the, all the void dancers generally have Craig Ricks just up. So one of the mm-hmm. ways to counterplay that is that you get more crits. And because you're playing Inquisition, you can actually rig the dice in your favor just a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Uh, the, the Mystic did help a bunch. Um, the Axe Jack was very, very useful. Um, that So like I said, I had my, my Axe Jack carried a lot of the weight. He was kind of the first one to go in. But then I used my Quest Keeper on, or I used my Mystic on my Quest Keeper. Because he's just a nuts profile, and he pretty much just at that point one sh- like two taps any um, void dancer. He gets to charge. He then has a five up feel no pain. Yeah, you Actually, gotta, he, even, he just has a five up statically. Yeah, and then the axe shack is the one that's getting the other five up feel no pain. So you yep, got yep. a he, makes charge, and then he already has a lethal five up as well. Yeah, so, so you've got a yeah, pair of just... melee operatives that are good with crits that can charge in and tank and, you know, maybe live through a combat with enough wounds to go and hit someone else or tank one whole attack and get one swing in. Right. Yep. Yep. And that's and that actually ends up what it happening is I would charge in, kill an operative. And I think my quest keeper ended up actually killing two Harlequins. I charged into him, killed a guy and I had a guy that had, he had like my guy had like one wound left. And um, he like hit me and then I just smacked him again because Quest Keeper can hit on death. So <laughs> hit him for another six after that. And it's just like, oh, man, that feels bad. <laughs> Run a full health Harlequin into a, a guy with one wound to leave injured. But yeah, this and then like the same thing I had the just use the, using the axe jack to go in there, get charged, kill a guy. And then now he's like, who's all, he can also like body block with a five up say with a four up save um, with like a five up feel no pain. It, he can take a lot before he he gives up that a point. Yeah, that makes sense. So you do like your melee axe, the melee helpers, and you're using some of the more flexible operatives from the Imperial Navy breachers, like the cat. 
which I think some players at the World Championships, they weren't running the cat, and we were surprised because it is such a powerful piece as far as giving you utility on a lot of boards. Like, sure, you don't get to do the GA2 thing that the actual breachers get to do, but still getting a no-go zone with your surveyor is definitely worth an operative, especially on a team as wide as the Inquisition, who have maybe one operative to go throw away doing that job. Yep, yep. Yeah, I find it more useful just for a number of reasons. I like, I like it makes people not want to move up as far. It makes them want to play a little bit safer. Um, if they do overextend, like I said, you can really punish them like hardcore. Um, sometimes people, or even worst case scenario, they just kill your cat, and you're like, okay, you really had to go out of your way to do that now, and now you've wasted a whole shooting attack. I, they just, they just either they deal with it or they don't. And if they, it's like literally a win win situation, I feel like. Yeah, that that is kind of like one of the things I like to think about the cat as well is like, even if you even if it doesn't do anything, if it like makes people like behave funny and like spend activations to destroy it when, you know, it's just like eats up time and, and you know, it's 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 an activation game. So like eating up enough time to to get people where you want them is very valuable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it does technically count for as one APL towards objectives. Same with like the skull. So like. There's definitely there's a, a, like there's times when you can actually if you get the opportunity if you take central control you can you can sometimes get them into the central position in safe spot if there's like nobody else there and you just get central control because your cat's there. Yeah, and you then know. like another thing I've seen with the skull is like people will just like put it out there and just like park next to someone to to give the bonus and then like if people don't have the action economy to deal with it, it just gets away with it or or like if, if they do it's like. I'm totally fine with you having to shoot like your last activation is a plasma gun and then I move the skull out and it's like is that the only thing you're going to give me and then it's just like the plasma goes after the skull or something like that I mean just the skull can get away with a lot of stuff just because you've got threats all over the place it's kind of the point there yeah he's not a threat himself he's just a body <laughs> and it's just like that can also do things for you yeah how long did, how long did it take for you to kind of start doing well with the team because i know the team is not the easiest team to play it's got a lot of it's got a lot of moving pieces not the best ballistic skill a wide range of things you can take you know jay was out here talking about taking infiltration and like tricking people for you know what tac ops he was going to do so how long did it take for you as a player to kind of ramp up on inquisition and start feeling like you were competent and during that what helped you feel confident like what plays did you start doing that you were like oh this is working pretty regularly you know um i i pretty much been playing the team since they came out maybe not like all the time but i was i started playing them when they came out i got really lucky and was able to pick up an app as a faith box um from a local store from south dakota where i'm originally from because no one else had really ordered it and so i pre-ordered it through them and then I uh, then I will actually happen to pick up an Ash as a faith box as well. And he wanted the the chaos call. He didn't want any of the Inquisition. So I buy his half of the Inquisition too to make the full roster. And so I've been kind of I've been had everything set up. I already had our bodies, like I said, and I had already picked up at Castrican at that point too. And uh, I kind of been playing him, and I don't think it was until November when I started playing Renegade because. I wasn't really planning on trying to win Renegade. I, I'm not that great of a player, and I, I wanted to play for fun. And I was like, hey, there's nothing good. I just and because we were, we were going to play like eight games, I think, or seven or eight games that weekend. I was like, this will be really good to just grind games out to learn Inquisition. And I, by the time I started that that on that Saturday, and I actually, and then the end of that the last couple games on Sunday, I felt like I had you know learned that team like tenfold. Yeah, another reason to get out to your local tournaments and get some games in. Yeah, and and also you should definitely post pictures of your display board from Renegade because that was that was a really incredible display. Yeah, a little overboard, but um, my wife really likes to build display boards with me, so I let her go hard on uh, two of them. Yeah, it turned out great. great. Yeah, um, just so you know, Travis, I, I built I took Inquisition as my team, and then I built. Um, I had a display board for each of my incinerary supports. <laughs> that little, very, very they were, cool. Yeah, they were all like in their own little like native zone, and then there was like yeah, so it was like it was like five boards put together in one with uh, with all the different support options and all that. Yeah, it looked really cool. Yeah, uh, you had little LED lights in in one of them at least. Yep, the our body precinct one that I I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was the one great. I'm most proud of. 
<laughs> that was properly epic. So, you know, make sure to get pictures up on our Discord so that, you know, the listeners can see. Or maybe, you know, if you post some pictures of your miniatures that are that we can have our our social media guy cut out, maybe we can just actually have our faces on your miniatures this for this upcoming week. I would be down for that. <laughs> all right, all right. How how are things going in the Midwest? Because you guys are in the same play scene. You know, it's been a minute since we caught up a little bit. So how's it going? You guys thinking about uh, putting your events up on the UTC? Yeah. So um, uh, do you want to take this, Lee, or do you want me to jump no, in? No, I was going to say that I I haven't actually really done much with Best Coast Parents or UTC at all. I've, the few games that tournaments that I've hosted, my Best Coast Parents doesn't ever work for me. So Jason's been doing it all. <laughs> Yeah, and, and like the last one was was extra extra buggy. It was like I couldn't get the website to work. I couldn't do anything. So we ended up just like we everyone signed up, and then it just like crashed, and we did it manually. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm hoping to get some like something on the UTC soon. Um, I think that would be a lot of fun. Like in general, the club is is doing well. Um, we're pretty like centralized again for any other Minnesota listeners that haven't already joined. Uh, we've been doing Tuesday nights at Game Center which is it's got like a big free parking lot and they've they've got like you know some snacks and they've got like um a big enormous amount of space um so it's a cool spot um and and like the Tuesday nights have been going generally pretty strong uh I missed the last one but it seems like we've had plenty of times where we've hit like at least like 12 to 14 people nice. um which yeah, is I mean, which is pretty for cool for a weekly game night that's that's really good actually yeah. Um, yeah. And then the the Renegade thing is coming up and um, that is landing on a pretty bu- busy weekend for me. Um, I'm hoping I can make it to at least like one of the days of Renegade. Um, uh, so you're actually working on some of the stuff with that, Lee. Um, do you remember what weekend that is so we can shout it out? Um, oof, I'd have to double check. I'm horrible at remembering these dates. I think it's like late May. Or yeah, I want to say it's like May, t- like the second the last weekend in may 23rd i think that sounds right we'll double check and and make sure we or uh it'll be in the on, show now that's the wrong one uh 25th is that weekend in may we'll figure it out it'll be in the show notes don't worry listeners if you're in the minnesota area or the midwest and you want a tournament to go to the renegade opening is coming up soon we'll have a narrative tournament run by lee so if Lee vibe sounds like your thing. You know, maybe it's a good time to check out the yeah, narrative. Well, Will be helping there. me too. It's going to be a, the co-op thing with me and Will. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll probably be like involved in the play testing and stuff. Um, and maybe I'll make it out that day. I just got to like nail down my my calendar for that for all of May, really. Yeah, there's, there's, I got a lot of really cool rules. It's a lot of custom missions. I, me and Will are both very, very excited for this new one. We've been brainstorming. Um, are you guys going to use Beta Decima in the narrative stuff at all? Um, a little bit. We're going to use Beta Decima, but we're not going to use the ocean board. We're going to just, it's going to be on op- like on an open board, which is actually one of the first missions we came up with is that we um, um, call it like escalating tensions. So it's basically like uh, the first map will be that have those Beta Decima terrain. But then after the first turning point, um, basically the base level becomes like it, you, you just get incapacitated. And then on the third turning point, then the second level. So then basically forces everybody on top of we're, we're planning on having probably two furnace tops up there. And then so you have everybody that's alive still like up on these furnaces. Oh, man, I absolutely love that. This is the first time I've heard of that. And I'm really excited about that. <laughs> it does sound cool. I think having like a nice visual meme like definitely helps sell the events. Because mm-hmm. when players walk in and they see like, oh, look at this like double tiered thing. Like that's part of why Necro and Mordheim boards look so cool is because they've got so many more layers. And I think that's one thing that Beta Decima does well, even if the games aren't maybe the most competitive at the moment. But just like as you're walking around, seeing those three different levels of play is mm-hmm. is nice. It's just the rule set is maybe not robust enough or mm-hmm. there just needs to be more room that's usable. Yeah, yeah. The beta decimal is like is is super fun when you're playing with teams that are like pretty balanced for it. But it it feels very very bad if you're playing against a team that's like really strong on it. Yeah, I think Ace hit it on the head where it's like if it's two teams that aren't good at beta decima, it's fine. If it's two teams that are good at beta decima, it's also fine. It's when there's like the mismatch that it's like, ooh, I'm just gonna stand mm-hmm. here as the boy dancers get out to all the points, and then I'm gonna have to fight them on their terms. Or it's like, ooh, that commando started up and he's just nailing me, and I there's literally nothing I can do. Those yeah. are definitely not great. 
Yeah, if you have like, a, like a, yeah, I know I'm kind of scared to play a, like a horde team that has good shooting. Like, I, I feel like that guard could potentially be really good if they get a can, if they get allowed to set up. Just because you get enough bodies, you just doesn't matter where you are. You're just not going to be able to hide. I don't yeah, have I cast just, cults, but I want to play chaos cults on beta decima. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe I just I'll... wish that I just wish that beta decima had more playable space. I think like the only side of the maps that I think have felt playable are the the side with the extra cutout in the middle, just so that you have more avenues to like move around. When you're oh, playing yeah. on just a huge open board, it's it's just hard to make enough play space where it feels like you're actually playing the game and you're not just like ah there's a vantage overlooking the entire space where i must go yeah it's yeah it can feel bad for sure i it, it almost needs like more cover but like at the same time you can't there's like it's already hard to shoot sometimes on that map if you had cover sometimes it's like oh there's just gonna be no shooting <laughs> at all yeah, it's definitely one of the one of the things that I'm struggling with as far as that terrain goes. Like, I feel like it needs more terrain or some of the some of the pieces just needed a little bit more cover. But it is what it is. I don't know if it'll become standardized just because it feels like a lot of the regions have such disparate opinions on it right now. So time will tell. Yeah, I definitely need some different rulings i was kind of hoping that the balanced data sheet would be out today so that we could <laughs> discuss it and hopefully there would more be more rules on it some yeah. faqs don't worry fellow listeners you know me and jason will have a bonus episode the moment that drops so we'll have hot takes abound and maybe some other hot takes later in the month um yeah well um is there any other final shout outs that we want to do before we call it episode end uh, for anyone um, in the East Coast area, you know, in June, FLG is running the Atlantic City Open. I might still be the TO there. I'm not 100% sure yet. I'm kinda trying to figure out. So mark your calendars if you want to go to the Atlantic City Open. <laughs> what about you, Lee? Um, I mean, I feel like I, I deserve to shout out Blaine because I was actually supposed to be playing a game with him on Saturday. But like I said, I wasn't feeling that great. So I kind of dodged. Um, and then I got met up with Will a little bit just because he's a we are obviously local or me and him i was gonna meet blaine uh about an hour and a half away two hours to play a game of, of kill team but i want to give him a shout because he's a super nice guy he came down for that kill team and he just wants to help grow the midwest kill team scene and i just appreciate that yeah for listeners who don't know blaine is six sided legion i met him at the first chicago open he's one of the he went to the world championships last year is on the first of the chaos cult tickets <laughs> real stand-up guy and the six sided legion also do a little bit of content on youtube so you know if anyone yeah. wants to give their channel a listen or a look make sure to take a look because they're yeah. definitely friends of the podcast we've had blaine on in the past way way back when we first started this yeah, yeah he and they also just started a, a discord so uh mm -hmm. if he's listening he should drop that <laughs> yeah i mean as far as ooh. Any other thing that you're excited on in the future, you know, outside of like just kill team? I know in the pre-show notes, we've got you've got other hobbies, you know, anything else that you're excited for? Um, Just getting my other kill teams done. I, right now I'm working on painting uh, some vet guard up and some Phobos that I've dropped a couple of photos of my my new Phobos, but uh, they're they're works in progress. There's a lot of time excited to get yeah. those done. Oh, but are definitely some of the cooler models, so I'm still surprised it's taking a little bit longer. I know mine took a while, even though I hated them on release. Yeah, the Vetguard models, though, those those to me are gorgeous. Those I've been I have been having a lot of fun painting those. Oh yeah, they're the classic. They're classic at this point. Like they were classic when they were Krieg Forge World models, and they remain classic in plastic. Uh, but, right. Well, I mean. You know, there's a lot for listeners to get a hold of. You know, if you have, if anyone who's listening is really into narrative or has cool narrative stories or wants to talk a little bit about their their um, stories, come on our Discord and tell us. You know, we've got a growing community that continues to get larger and larger. And I think the most recent conversation on our niche tactics was about corn legionaries. So plenty of silly things going on there. Yeah, we need to we need to have more Phobos guys in there. <laughs> we talk about Phobos on the pod a lot. I'm sure we can generate a lot of Phobos <laughs> chat in the Discord. Yeah, so we much. almost need to have like a Phobos versus Legionary tournament. 
<laughs> we'll just make a specific Discord channel that's just Phobos and Legionary. <laughs> That'd be actually fun to have like a, a narrative event though, just <laughs> Phobos versus Legionary. Next big idea right there. <laughs> I mean, soon we're going to have a whole, a whole nother flavor of Space Marine. You know, you could have like the intercession oh, yeah. and the legionary face off while the Phobos and the Night Lords face off and then kind of bounce them off each other. So, yeah, that would be fun. I, I could get behind that. It could be an all the Putting that up would be a lot, a lot better. And all the Stardis uh, Thunderdome. If you're feeling really oh, yeah. hipster, you can bring Grey Knights and Death Watch. <laughs> I, Death Watch would probably slap in an all Space Marine tournament. So. That's true. Oh, and if you're Three. really feeling hipster, bring heavy intercessors. Yeah, poor, poor <laughs> Justin, Justin, and finally nerfed all the way. I think part of the internet discussion recently was that some GW rep for some event said that the heavy intercessor is actually at four attacks on Justin. Oh, is it really? <laughs> That's Ooh. a rumor I haven't confirmed, and you know, until that they actually got it for it, you know, just you know, for for the time being, better to play Justin in Japan than in America. You got to get the, the the other cards are better there. All right, Lee, thanks for coming on and talking about all this cool stuff. I'm hoping that your narrative event goes well. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll have some pictures up from the New York Open about some cool Titan boards, some teasers along the way. Yes, I, I'm like, very excited to see those. I appreciate you inviting me on. And thank you listeners for listening until the end. 